listening to Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. And now, here's your host. Welcome back to the program. I'm Zev Brenner. My son-in-law, David first says, you must interview Professor Robert Peter George, one of the leading conservative thinkers, philosophers in the United States. In fact, this month he has something called Fidelity Month, which we'll talk about. So very pleased that Professor Robert Peter George joins us. He's a legal scholar, political philosopher, public intellectual, who serves as the sixth McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program American Ideals Institution at Princeton University. He lectures on civil liberties, philosophy. He's worked with Rabbi, um, the chief rabbi, the former chief rabbi of England, with Jonathan Sachs, who works with Rabbi Mary Soloveitchik, and looking for a more moral America. So thank you for joining us. It's my very great pleasure, Zeb. Thank you for having me on the broadcast. Well, thank you. So tell us, let's start. America is going in a direction we're seeing, especially Generation Z is becoming more woke, more liberal. Are people starting to wake up and saying we want to get back to a more solid track like the way we used to be? Are you finding that to be the case? Things seem to be going, Zev, in precisely the wrong direction. Uh, the survey data seem consistent now that uh, people have lost faith in God, uh, lost faith in the institution of marriage and the family, uh, lost faith in their country, uh, lost the spirit of patriotism, lost the sense of the importance of serving one's communities. If you look at the most recent uh, polling, the Wall Street Journal uh, poll, you'll see that the one thing that uh, uh, whose importance has risen uh, for Americans is money. Uh, they believe in the importance of money even more than they did before, uh, but it's gone in the other direction when it comes to faith in God, family, marriage, community, country. Yeah, you remind me, there's an expression that used to be in the olden days, they say, in the biblical days, say people gave up gold to get to God, to build the golden calf today, yeah. God to get to the gold, right? That's what you're basically saying. Yes, and uh, as you're pointing out right now, it's not the first time in human history that this has happened. So the question is, you're looking to build a more moral America. So how do we get people to be involved in family and religion and helping people and being part of society as opposed to being narcissistic and just caring about me, me, me? my money, my vacations, my life, and pretty much not concerned about anybody else? Well, let's ask ourselves uh, how things have worked in the past. How have we turned things around in the past? Uh, when we have uh, sunk uh, to lower depths, uh, how did we pull ourselves up out of the mire? Uh, one thing we need is prophecy. That is, people were calling us to our best selves people reminding us of the importance of the most fundamental values, the things that really matter, the things that aren't merely instrumentally valuable, like money, wealth, power, influence, prestige, status, but the things that really matter because they are things that are worthwhile in themselves, faith, family, friendship, fidelity, truth, honor, goodness. So someone needs to speak the truth out loud about these things. We need prophets to call people back to the most fundamental values. And then we need people who will set a good example. All of us can do this in our own lives by being faithful to God, by being faithful to our spouses and to our families, by being patriotic and loyal to our country, by serving our communities. You'll, you'll remember from the 1960, um, uh, uh, presidential inaugural speech by John F. Kennedy. Uh, he put it before Americans that they should not ask what their country can do for them. They could, should ask what, what they can do for their country. Well, we should be asking the same question about our country, yes, but also about our family, our spouse, our community. I shouldn't be asking, what can my wife do for me? I should be asking, what can I do for my wife? What can I do for my community? Are you paraphrasing Kennedy, President Kennedy said, don't ask what, what your country can do for you, what you can do for your country? Yes, and I think we need to go beyond uh, country, although I think it's very important to ask that question. I think Kennedy was right about that. But I think we need to ask the same question about all the different aspects of our lives. Stop being so concerned with what other people, other institutions can do for me. We gotta get beyond this narcissism of me, 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 me. 
uh, and start asking ourselves the question, how can I serve? How can I serve my country? Perhaps as a soldier, but perhaps in other ways. How can I serve my spouse? How can I serve my children? How can I serve my community? Ultimately and most importantly, how can I serve God? You know, you know Zev, these values of faith in God, faithful marriages, families, uh, service to the community, uh, love of country, these used to be the values that unified Americans and brought us strength despite our many differences. This is a, an exceptionally pluralistic country. We come from different racial backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, religions, cultural histories, and so forth and so on. What unites us? There has to be something that unites us. What strengthens? Where do we find our strength despite our, our differences? Well, historically, it's been in shared values. Yes, our constitutional principles, that's true, but also a shared faith in God, a shared faith in marriage and the family, a shared faith in our country, a shared faith in the importance of our communities. If, if we don't get back to that, we're going to lose our strength and we're going to lose our unity. And you see it happening right now. We're a weaker country than we have been. We're a more dis, dis, uh, d uh, divided country, disunified country, polarized country than we have been. So professor, what you're saying sounds great on paper, but how do we get people to accept this because i just read the wall street journal the other day you let's take even something like taking a test there's such rampant cheating i think two-thirds of students are cheating they're going back to oral exams because people are cheating with ai or other methods so we seem to be going further down not going up and this is not just beginning with ai uh this has been going on for a long time we've seen an erosion of people's uh internal governor that says you shouldn't cheat. You shouldn't be the kind of person who cheats. I've been seeing this for 25 years. Uh, you know, when I myself was a student back in the Middle Ages, it wasn't as if nobody cheated. Cheating did happen, but it wasn't as widespread. People didn't feel good about cheating. And if someone did cheat, they weren't proud of themselves for cheating. We've had a loss of conscience. Students today, in very many cases, when they cheat, they don't even feel badly about it. They're only concerned about one thing. Will I get caught? That's a bad situation. We need, we need conscience. We need people to not cheat, not just in school, but in business and on their taxes and in life. We need people to not cheat because they don't want to be the kind of people who do that. They're concerned about their own virtue and their own character. They're concerned not only about what other people think, but about what God thinks. If we don't get back to that, we're gonna be in very bad shape in this country. And so what do we do? You ask Zev, what do we do? First thing we do is we speak the truth about these things out loud. People are afraid to say it today. People are afraid to say we should be patriotic. It's not woke. You sound like you're unsophisticated. You sound like you're a hick. People are afraid to say, we need to restore our faith in God. Oh, that sounds old fashioned. That sounds like you're not with it. You're not modern. Or you say, we should, we, should restore our, 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 we should restore faithful marriages. We should restore the idea that, that you should be loyal and faithful to your spouse. Oh, well, that sounds anachronistic. That sounds old fashioned. It's time that we have the courage to sound old fashioned. And then the second thing we have to do after speaking is to model the behavior we want. We need to model for our young people the behavior we want them to emulate. We can't say one thing and do another thing because our young people, they'll figure out we're hypocrites instantaneously and they'll ignore what we say. Tell us about, you've established Fidelity Month. What does that mean? What is What are you doing during this month of June, which you're calling Fidelity? Uh, we're inviting people to use this month, take this opportunity to rededicate themselves to those principles that have historically been our sources of unity and strength despite our many differences. And those principles, those values are fidelity to God, fidelity to one's spouse and one's children, fidelity to one's country, and fidelity to one's communities. That's what Fidelity Month is all about. It's rededicating. It's a period of rededication. We know from all the great faiths, all the great religions, there need to be periods of renewal. There are holidays and, and, uh, and periods, months sometimes, weeks sometimes, when we set them aside in order to renew our commitments. Now is the time to renew our commitments to these principles of fidelity. 
So are you finding people are responding to, to, to Fidelity Month? Oh, yes. And it's really been heartening. Uh, here we have the big advantage of, of social media. You know, people condemn social media. They criticize social media. And there's a lot of bad that goes on in social media. I understand that. But instead of just complaining all the time about social media, let's use it. And what I've found with Fidelity Month is social media has been the way we have spread the word. Uh, and the response of people has been tremendous across the faiths. Catholics, Protestants, Jews, Muslims have have responded they're they're using the fidelity month logo for their uh, social media pages they're uh, they're holding events they're talking with each other they're asking their religious leaders to speak about these values and i think sometimes the religious leaders are hesitant to speak about the values because they think that people don't want to hear about them but now we have people going to their rabbis going to their priests going to their ministers and saying we want you to preach about this we want to hear about this we want you to talk about the importance of these values Use. Now, you originally were a Democrat, right? And then you switched to becoming a Republican? I was born and brought up in the hills of West Virginia. Uh, and in those days, not only did we not like Republicans, we didn't know any. I think I grew up without not knowing a single Republican. It was a Democratic monoculture in those days. Uh, uh, we, we almost worshiped the memory of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Of course, uh, the coal mining union was very important. My grandfathers were coal miners. The Democratic Party was considered the party of the people. But of course, all that has has changed. Now it's hard to find a Democrat in West Virginia. Democrat West Virginia has now, as, as has most of Appalachia, gone Republican. And, and that's because of cultural issues. It's because of moral issues. The Democratic Party is the the party of wokeism and uh, the Republican Party has stepped into the place that the Democratic Party used to hold in the affections of the people from West Virginia and more broadly in Appalachia. So are you finding that people who gravitate to your ideals tend to be more Republicans than Democrats? Yes, although not exclusively by any means. Uh, these, these ideals still resonate in the hearts of a great many people across uh, partisan divisions, certainly across racial divisions, across religious uh, divisions. Um, so, you know, we're not we're not a Republican movement. We're not a conservative movement. We're, we're a movement of people who believes in these traditional values. Well, you started the conservative movement, right? And What's that now? Part, didn't you start the conservative movement integrating to mainstream Republicanism? Oh, that's uh, yeah. That's what they say on Wikipedia about me. Uh, I wouldn't right. believe. I wouldn't believe everything you read about Wikipedia. They give me too much credit. <laughs> well, t tell us about the conservative movement because uh, they do attribute it to you. So you had some role in it. Well, I uh, uh, yeah, I myself am a conservative. Um, I um, uh, believe in the principles of uh, conservatism. I I believe that. Uh, and, well, to, to be a conservative in America is not to be a, a European style conservative. Uh, there's a there's a very big difference between European and American conservatism. European conservatism, the conservatism of the ancient regime, is the conservatism of blood and soil and throne and altar. American conservatism, at its best, is not that. It's the old fashioned liberalism, you might call it, of uh, James Madison and Alexis de Tocqueville. It's Madisonian Tocquevillian liberalism. It's, it's the belief in, in small government, the dignity of the individual, the importance of the family and the institutions of uh, civil society, the importance of personal responsibility, hard work, reaching out to neighbors, not relying on the government to do everything for you. Yes, Government has a role. Yes, government needs to be there to provide a safety net when other things uh, fail. But we should uh, we should take responsibility for our own lives and take responsibilities for the lives of those people who are who are in need and not just turn everything over to the government. Now, you mentioned before that predominantly most of the people that are following the Fidelity Month and interested in your ideals tend to be Republicans. But the people that are most woke are not the Republican, but the Democrats. So the question is, we want to change society. Don't we have to have more Democrats to those who are woke, who are more self-absorbed, self-centered, that are cheating, that are, have changed the idealism? How do we reach out to them to get them to be part of a new thinking? Well, I think the most important way to influence, especially young people, is to lead by example. Uh, and among the 
things that we need to exemplify is courage. Uh, young people today are afraid to step out of line. They're afraid to be, they would be canceled if they express any dissent or even entertain in their own minds any dissent from the contemporary woke orthodoxies. What they need are role models, Zev, people who have the courage to defy those orthodoxies and speak out and make their arguments and give their reasons. Uh, I think the best way we can win people over is by exemplifying courage. When you say courage, what do you mean? What do you want people to do? Is just say, I'm, I'm believe in God, I'm a moral person. Is that what people should be going about? Yeah, saying? Stand, stand up for the important things. That's right. You know, don't, don't be afraid uh, to uh, acknowledge uh, the sovereignty of God. Don't be afraid to speak up for marriage as the union of husband and wife and the importance of the family. Uh, don't be afraid to speak up for the United States of America now, we have had some faults in our history. There's no doubt. I don't want to whitewash those. We have a terrible history of slavery and segregation and Jim Crow. But we also have a great history of overcoming those things, of people, white and black, Jewish and Christian, making great sacrifices to defeat the regime of Jim Crow and, and the uh, legacy of, of slavery. That's got to be acknowledged. Uh, we are the people who defeated. My, my father is a great World War II hero. My, my fa late father-in-law the same. These were the people who defeated Imperial Japan and Nazi Germany and saved civilization. We should be proud of that. We shouldn't be ashamed to be Americans. Yes, there are bad things in our history. There are bad things in the history of every country. We should acknowledge them. We shouldn't whitewash them. But let's not be afraid to speak up for the great achievements of the United States of America. And let's not be ashamed or afraid to speak up for our constitutional principles. We have the greatest constitution in the world, Zev. It's a constitution of liberty. It's a constitution that honors the, the dignity of the human person. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Most nations of the world don't have that principle at their foundation. We do. We should be proud of that, and we should conserve that. If you want to know how I'm a conservative, I believe in conserving the principles of the American founding and the Constitution. We're seeing Professor Robert Peter George. He's a leading intellectual, American philosopher, legal scholar, public intellectual, serves uh, with Princeton University, and he's influenced the conservatism in America, in the United States. And we're looking at how we can change society, how we can make this a more moral society, how we can go back from woke to awake. And that's something which we have to talk about as well. Uh, You're listening to Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. And now, here's your host. And we're back, American legal scholar, political philosopher, public intellectual. He shaped conservatism in America. Professor Robert Peter George joins us. He also has Fidelity Month and... Uh, we're looking at how we can make a change, how we can make a difference. Let's take some phone call. Let's go to Judy in Brooklyn. Judy in Brooklyn, you have a question or comment for our guest. Go ahead, Judy. Yes, hi. Before I have a com uh, question or comment whatever with your wonderful guest, this professor, Zev, I want to tell you, Alan Dershowitz, who you have on, needs to go back to Yeshiva, okay? Because his Ten Commandments is not man's law. Explain to him that the first five on the first set of Lufos is Bain Adam Lamako. And the second five is saying Adam Kavera and man, all of them man, are man, God and man and man. But listen, we have Professor George on when okay. Alan George was right. on. I'm sure you can address the question. So let's let's okay. focus on Professor George. Go ahead. Yeah, well, you know what, Professor George, but you know, if I talk about the Ten Commands, it's about God and everything, so it kind of fits in. Okay, Professor, I'm listening to you. I, lo I love everything you're saying, but I just want to point out there is a huge movement, a huge push for EI, which stands for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, which is being pushed in many universities and schools all over this country. And basically, this is not anything but. It's really against all white people. We're all a bunch of racist supremacists. And they're basically uh, very divisive, very exclusive, not inclusive, middle school of hatred. And they push this all over. What are your thoughts? Of, and by the way, you saw right now, I see a band, the Bible. So we're dealing with a lot of perversion, a lot of anti-God, a lot of anti-morals, a lot of everything that is just almost satanic, okay? Like you have Pride Month, I like the way you have your month. 
um, it, it's like uh, in the targets, whatever, they have these things. And it's, it's this guy, he's saying a, a transgender man who's a woman. It's so confusing. And he calls it satanic stuff. We're really into very low moral, uh, what should I tell you, um, influx of indoctrination and all this stuff. What do you think? How do we combat that? Well, thank you very much for uh, that question. At the heart of your question is the establishment in universities throughout the country and other institutions, including business corporations, of offices of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Well, those words sound very good, don't they? They're very pretty words. Diversity, who can be against that? Equity, we should all be for that. Inclusion, yes, we want everybody to be included. Sounds so great. But now we've had several years of it in practice, and all too often, diversity, equity, and inclusion offices become engines for attacks on freedom of speech, attacks on freedom of thought, efforts to uh, destroy viewpoint diversity, which is so important on university campuses. It's very important that uh, in uh, situations of higher education, students are exposed to the best that's to be thought and said on all the sides of uh, controversial issues on which reasonable people of goodwill disagree. So these efforts to, in effect, establish an intellectual monoculture uh, to uh, destroy true diversity, diversity of thought, diversity of ideas, are very, very uh, dangerous. So I share your uh, concern about these diversity, equity, and inclusion offices and about the whole ideology of diversity, equity, and inclusion. The words are great, but the reality is not great. Uh, the reality is very, very dangerous. If we're to flourish as a society and certainly in our educational institutions, we need true diversity, diversity of thought. We need to avoid indoctrination. We need to encourage students to think deeply, think critically, always including self-critically, and above all, to think for themselves, to encourage independence Professor, of mind. Professor, let me just, I'm sorry, I hear what you're saying, but you are dealing now with, um, I don't know, activist uh, uh, teachers in these universities that are sitting there pushing all of this garbage, excuse me, on these students. And if you take a look at the commencement speech from this woman, Fatima, whatever, and Musa. Fatima uh, Mohammed, you're talking about this yeah. city college, well, city CUNY yeah. law school. Yeah. Right. She's a perfect example of the product of what they are doing to these students. She's a perfect example of her hatred, her anti-American rhetoric, her anti-cop, anti-military, anti-Israel, everything anti. But Judy, I want to stop for a moment because the New York Times did an article today, Professor, and they basically said if we're teaching, I'm paraphrasing, we're teaching all these kids to, to, to you know, to, to fight for, you know, liberation and nationalism and all these other stuff, so how can you be angry at them if they take it up at, at commencement speech? This is what we've been teaching them. So why are you angry about them? This is what they've been taught. <laughs> yeah. justify. In other words, in other words, we failed to teach them. We've simply no, indoctrinated the them. Things, you know, that's we, what we've filled their heads right. with nonsense. I, I want I want the views that she represented to be aired. I, I don't mind them being aired. At a commencement um, speech? What's that? Yeah. But commencement I, address? Yeah, yeah, but I want uh, the well, counter second, argument. Second, Jay, Professor, but let me answer this. There's a time and place for everything. So right. why is a commencement address where it's to the general public? Oh, no, I, I'm not person. concerned about it being a commencement. What I'm talking about is the classroom. The, in, in the classroom, we need all points of view to be aired, and people need to engage them and consider the arguments on the competing sides. Okay, so Believe I, me, I, if students, I, I, hang on, let me finish. If, if students are presented with the best that has been thought and said on all sides of competing issues, they're going to come out the right way. They're smart. Students aren't dumb. Kids aren't dumb today. They're plenty smart. The trouble is they're being indoctrinated. The trouble is they're not presented with the best that's been thought and said. Instead, they're just fed a party line. And of course, they believe the party line. It's like a catechism class. It's like indoctrination. Judy? Professor. Professor, yeah. they're being fed. They're being fed a pack of lies, a pack of yeah, lies. Yeah, I you agree. Understand that, and that's what they're being fed, and that's not fair. So I, you know, that's that's part of the huge problem of these lies. But let me just say, CUNY, for instance, uh, they promote BDS. BDS is BS because absolutely opposite what's the truth, and yet they 
we, our taxpayers' money, pay for CUNY, and they stand by BDS, okay? And if you want to know something, I don't understand what they have. Are they, so is CUNY then supporting pay for slaying, you know, against Israelis? Is CUNY supporting the little children all in Gaza being taught to take knives and kill things? They don't teach that in Israel. Uh, how many Jews are in Gaza over there? Zero. How many, how many Arabs are in Israel? Two million. On and on, I can tell you all the BS and the thing, the BDS. And CUNY stands there, and I think even Governor, what's his name, or uh, what's his name, Cuomo, he, he, was, he said it's illegal. He banned BDS. How could CUNY over here be for BDS? Well, here's, no, 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 Judy, I'm going to let the press respond. I'm going to broaden the question because the, I know what, what the professor you've been saying is that we should be teaching all sides. The problem is, is that the woke professors are afraid to teach us a side and they don't teach it. So you have these students walk mm -hmm. out. Uh, one way I heard, I heard Congressman Richie Torres speak at the Jewish Center today. He made a joke. He said, yes, you know, a congressman as to why he's, uh, you know, pro-Israel is basically because he dropped out of college. <laughs> Yeah. Well, um, uh, on the question of BDS, uh, you might be interested in uh, the speech that I gave against BDS at Princeton. There was a movement at Princeton to try to get Princeton to adopt it. And I gave a speech that's uh, on video against uh, BDS, which you can find on YouTube if you type in my name and uh, the, the BDS controversy. Anyway, Judy, thank you for your good well, question. Well, you know what? Zeb, Zeb, one second. I want to tell you something, just as you know. Uh, my husband, we have a doctor um, at whatever. He goes to Harvard every week uh, to teach whatever. And he says right there on the campus, it says, Harvard says, no Jews are welcome here. All right? Oh, this terrible. Is what we're dealing with. Terrible. Yeah, this is what we're dealing with right here. Mm -hmm. Professor, you're terrific, and I really wish we could uh, clone you. <laughs> oh, thank <laughs> you. You're very kind. Your message you. is terrific. Thank you. Thank you for your call. Okay, we're going to take another call just a moment. Here's an email question from Alex. I'm a former military officer and decades old history student. I ask one question, who benefits? Looks like our top leaders, including Antifa, BLM, benefit PRC armed forces. What is your opinion? Do we observe high treason and our high echelons of power? If yes, what can be done? Uh, well, uh, yeah, I mean, that's the right question. Qui bono? Uh, who benefits? Uh, very often when uh, terrible things are done, the motivation for the terrible things is that people in power benefit from those terrible things. Now, sometimes mistakes are innocent and we all make mistakes. So, you know, we, we, need, to be, we need to be cognizant of that. But sometimes we have not just mistakes, we have people deliberately benefiting from decisions that harm the common good, that harm people, that violate people's rights, that hurt the rest of the people, especially uh, those who are not in uh, power. So I think he's asking a very good, very important question, and we should always ask it. We should ask it, for example, about the contemporary issues with gender ideology and transgenderism. Who's benefiting from this? Well, I'll tell you something. Big drug companies are benefiting from it. You know, big medicine is benefiting from it, from the surgeries, from the hormones, from the uh, from the puberty blockers, uh, from the lifetime of medicalization that uh, children who are so-called transitioned are subjected to. So there's a very good pl place to ask the question, who benefits? You're saying it's all money. I'm saying money's got a lot to do with it. And that's when money and ideology come together, that's a very powerful thing. Stand up for ourselves. Uh, Thank you for waiting. Go ahead. Uh, I'm trying to figure you out. And uh, you say you're conservative, and that's fine, all dandy and well. I'm curious, uh, the decision by the Supreme Court of the United States on women and abortion, uh, did you find that acceptable? Yeah, there is um, the decision overturned the decision in Roe versus Wade in 1973, which uh, found or claimed to find uh, a right to abortion in the Constitution. Uh, the trouble with that decision is that nothing in the text, the logic, the structure, or the historical um, uh, understanding of the Constitution uh, supports any idea that there's a right to abortion in the Constitution. So the Supreme Court was 100% right a year ago to overturn that decision in the Dobbs ruling. But the court said that they would not overturn, they would believe in precedent. They and certainly did not. President, and yet they, that's what they, oh yes, they did. No, they and didn't. So I'm curious, what, uh, do you believe if a president, a president is set 
that it should be over any ju- let me let me say something to this man zev had any candidate sure. any nominee for a supreme court decision promised to vote one way or another on a case on the question of he would overturn a decision he would have been immediately disqualified you are not allowed to promise a vote in order to get confirmation. None of those judges promised Many a vote. Many judges have vote. stated they believe in precedent. Oh, look, pre- no, every judge believes that there, that precedent is not sacrosanct. That's how Plessy versus Ferguson, the segregation well, yes, decision was overturned. Well, Listen, well, sir, well, in well, Brown well, against well, the Board of well, Education, well, your view of precedent would have made it impossible for segregation to be destroyed by the Supreme Court in the Brown decision. You're talking nonsense. I'm not talking nonsense. You are talking nonsense. Obviously what happened with the Supreme Court was nonsense, but uh, they basically... Was Brown versus Board rightly decided, sir? Overturn uh, Roe versus Wade. Was Brown versus Board of Education rightly decided? Until, until Mr. Trump put in new judges, and then they could do what they wanted to do. You say, you know, that uh, uh, the president was not there. The president was there. But okay, you go right ahead. Sure. Yeah, my question to you, sir, is Brown versus Board of Education rightly decided? It was correctly decided. It overturned precedent. Am I right, sir? That in that particular case, yes. Yes, your I argument is finished. You just you just destroyed your own argument. So there's a precedent for his argument. Anyway, Stan, I appreciate your phone call. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We. I, I hope you don't have too many listeners who are that ridiculous. Well, Stan is a, is a more liberal uh, listen. It's not a question of being liberal. It's a question of being rational. Precedent is either sacrosanct or it's not. It's clearly not. Brown versus Board was rightly decided, as he himself admitted. So precedents can be overturned. But like you said, you like having dialogue. You had dialogue with Cornell West, who you don't really agree with, but you had a dialogue. You were working together with him for a period of time. Yes, that's right. If people are willing to be rational, then you should dialogue with anybody who's willing to be rational, even if they completely disagree with you. Now, weren't you threatened with death by abortion right extremist Theodore Shulman? I was. He went to jail for three years. Because of that? Yes. Our guest, as you heard, is one of the leading conservative thinkers in the United States. He is somebody who uh, has helped craft or really brought conservatism more to the fore. He's a legal scholar, political philosopher, public intellectual. And we're looking at the, this month is called Fidelity Month, uh, which he has coined. I believe it didn't uh, uh, one of the candidates uh, pick up that theme. Did, did who pick up the themes? One of, one of, the, polit- one of the presidential candidates. Uh, DeSantis, uh, didn't he pick up? Yeah, Ron DeSantis' uh, press secretary tweeted out an endorsement. DeSantis himself, as far as I'm aware, has not spoken about it. Okay. Going to talk line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. And now, here's your host. And we're back. Professor Robert George with us. He's a leading intellectual. He is founded the one of the founding the conservative movement. He's had a lot of impact. And this month is Fidelity Month. Professor, you mentioned earlier that you would like to see, you know, a dialogue where you're not afraid of having other views and the right view will be, be gotten out. But the question, though, is, is that in college campuses today, they're afraid to have alternative views. For example, the pro-Israel view is stifled. Other views are stifled. So and we've had decades of this. So this is the, what we're seeing today is the fruit of all these decades of these woke liberal professors that have been inculcating our society. And that's why we're seeing that tremendous change fueled by social media, which is helping accelerate that. Well, you're right uh, here to talk about social media. Uh, Students, in many cases, are less afraid of dissenting from their professor's opinions and being punished by bad grade than they are of the social opprobrium of their fellow students who will call them nasty names on social media. So if we if we take the measure of the problem, we'll see that much of it is within the student community. It's not not just the faculty. There's plenty of problems with the faculty. But a big aspect of the problem is students being afraid of other students. That they certainly are afraid of other students, but it's also the faculty who 
is really inculcating these values. So they're really observing what the professors are teaching and um, and it just goes on and on and on because- That's why you need viewpoint diversity. That, that's why we need to diversify our faculties. Uh, if, if you look at the data, uh, you'll see that the overwhelming majority of university professors uh, at um, most universities, state and private, are on the left. Overwhelming. In, in many departments, there's not a single Republican, much less a conservative. There may be 30, 40 people on the left, almost all registered uh, Democrats. With that kind of viewpoint imbalance, you're going to have problems. You'd have the same problems if it were in the other direction. If you had a university that was you know, 99 percent on the right and only a tiny fraction on the left, you'd still suffer the same problems of the lack of viewpoint diversity. If you want to do education properly, students need to be seriously exposed to the best that has been said on the competing sides of every issue. And that's what's missing today. Let's hear from some of our listeners. Let's go to Avraham in Kensington, Brooklyn. Your question for our guests. Go ahead, Avraham. Hi, I'd just like to uh, make a quick uh, sideline. Uh, the punishment for threatening a Princeton professor is confinement in Yale for three years. Uh, <laughs> uh, otherwise, this question is both naive and cynical. Uh, and it's really to govern myself to what my rabbi will tell me, but since we're both conservative and are confronting the same issue, I would ask you, with respect to the conduct of the Republican Party following the decision, I think it was the Dodd decision, uh, some people are taking the approach of pedal to the metal, and some people are taking the approach of let's do what the market will bear. Yeah. Uh, what is the moral thing to do? I think the moral thing to do is incrementalism. You, you make as much progress as you can for now. You don't try to get everything at once because then you're just going to destroy your own case. Um, you, you try to move forward as the civil rights movement moved forward, not trying to get to the final ultimate destination immediately, but taking the time that's necessary to move public opinion forward. So I'm in favor of the incrementalist approach. Always have been, by the way. Thank you so much. And thank you for a good question. Listen, I think people are clamoring for a change. Now, you're doing something on different campuses throughout the United States. So tell us what you're doing on different campuses. You're starting small, but you're trying to make that change. What exactly are, are you doing? Well, in the year 2000, uh, 23 years ago, uh, I founded at Princeton the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions, a, a program devoted to um, getting our students to think really, really deeply and educating them very, very well on the principles of the American founding and on the great traditions from Athens and Jerusalem that fed uh, the, the, the American founding, this great experiment, as our founders called it, in Republican government and ordered liberty. And we started very small and now we're very big. We're a very big program on the Princeton campus, extremely active, very influential on the campus. We have 250 undergraduate fellows of the James Madison program, very active in the affairs of the program. We have many visiting uh, fellows uh, in, the, in the program who come in from other institutions, spend a year with us doing research, some of them teach. Uh, we have one very controversial one right now, actually from, uh, from Israel, uh, Dr. Ronan Chauvel. Um, and the success of our program has naturally raised the question, can you do it on other campuses? So I've been involved in trying to replicate the Madison program uh, at Harvard, at Johns Hopkins, at the University of Pennsylvania, at the University of Chicago, at Stanford, at other uh, universities. Uh, efforts are also being made in uh, state universities. Uh, there's a, a school of civic and economic thought and leadership modeled on the Madison program at the Arizona State University. They've just founded a new program uh, modeled on the Madison program at the University of Tennessee, their flagship campus at Knoxville. The new Hamilton program at the University of Florida is also modeled on the Madison program. We don't see any reason why something that is successful in one major university at Princeton can't be successful, can't be replicated at other universities. So we're doing our best to try to, try to do that. And, and our programs, by the way, we avoid indoctrinating students. My goal in our program is not to get students to think like me. 
my aim is not to get them to be conservatives. My goal is to get them to think for themselves, to think more deeply, more critically, and for themselves. It's not my job to tell them what to think. It is my job to help them to think clearly and independently. So you're not afraid of people hearing different ideas, but you want to get your idea across. Well. Yeah, I, I want them to be exposed to my ideas. I want them to be exposed to Cornell West's ideas. I want them to be exposed to Peter Singer's ideas. You know, I want them to be uh, exposed to the great thinkers of history. I, I for example, Zev, in my courses, I will often teach Marx. Now, I'll tell you something. You can't get much further away from Marx than me. <laughs> my, my views are as far from Karl Marx's views as you can get. And yet, I want my students to engage his views, to understand his views. They've been extremely influential. I think they've done a lot of harm in the world, but they've been extremely influential. And a lot of very intelligent people to this day think that Marx has a lot to offer. So I say, let the students read the material, think for themselves. Let's discuss it. Yeah, I want to hear Marx, but then they should read Hayek on Marx. They should read the other point of view and then let them decide for themselves. Now, but you're one of done in the classroom, which is not being done. But getting back to something that one of our callers, Judy, said earlier regarding the CUNY Law School is that the, you s supported um, the uh, Mohammed, uh, Fatima Mohammed, where she made an anti Israel, anti American address and the commencement address that that she gave uh you said you defended her position but isn't there a time and place if oh, oh yeah no I'm, I'm saying that her views should be permitted in the classroom e even though i'm totally opposed to them now a commencement address is a difference it's, let me tell you what my philosophy is on a commencement address at any university that's not itself a sectarian university so let's say we're not talking about yeshiva notre dame brigham young zaytuna Wheaton College, let's say we're talking about Princeton or Cooney or uh, University of Chicago or University of uh, Kansas. Anybody who's giving a commencement address will understand that there are students and families who are out there to celebrate the achievements of these young men and women who represent a broad spectrum of political and moral and religious views. There will be Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives. Christians and Jews and secular people, atheists, unbelievers, their job as a commencement speaker is not to give a sermon and advocate one side or another. That's just divisive at a commencement. So what I would defend them saying in the classroom, so long as the alternate point of view is given, would not be appropriate in commencement address. If I'm invited, I've given, I think something like 22 commencement addresses in my life. If I'm invited to give a commencement address, and I know that there are going to be students and families there to celebrate the achievements of these young people, representing a broad spectrum of political and moral and religious views, I'm not gonna to preach to them my views. I'm gonna celebrate those students. I'm gonna celebrate their achievements. I wanna say something interesting to them, but it doesn't have to be divisive. I mean, the trouble with this young woman is she stood up there and she preached a fire and brimstone sermon. She's like a fundamentalist preacher preaching a fire and brimstone sermon. That was not the right place for that. So if you ask me, should she be allowed to say it in a classroom? I say yes, but a commencement address is the wrong place. Now, what you like to see done is different ideas, but in our society today, the whole objective of wokeism is to have only one perspective. That's the problem. It's the orthodoxy. So look at CNN. CNN pretty much only has one viewpoint. Now, Fox, I, to their credit, did have opposing viewpoints. CNN didn't. You look at all these schools, it's, it's, they won't allow a speaker from a different perspective. Yeah, and, and in the case of a commencement address, when she's finished, there's no Q&A. There, you know, there's no discussion. There's no opportunity for somebody to present a different point of view. In the classroom, there is. If I stand up and I say my views in a classroom, unless I monopolize all the time, which I shouldn't do. But if I stand up and, and express my views or a student expresses her views, somebody else can criticize them. But at a commencement address, there's no opportunity for, do, for doing that. Now, I want to, in the few moments we have remaining, want you to address, I believe one of your students, Rabbi Mayor Soloveitchik, right? The oh, one of my greatest students ever. Yeah, Rabbi Mayor Soloveitchik, what an extraordinary human being. Not only brilliant, 
but brave, courageous, so charismatic. Uh, he, he, I'm so proud of him. And of course, you had a special relationship with Rabbi Jonathan, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. Oh, one of my dearest friends in the world. I called him my Jonathan, the way, you know, the, the way David and Jonathan had that special relationship where they understood each other. Uh, uh, I felt that Jonathan Sachs and I, Rabbi Sachs, Lord Rabbi Sachs, and I had, a, had that same sort of uh, understanding. We, we, uh, we could keep track with each other's thoughts. Uh, uh when he was uh when he would come to our area he would stay he and his wife elaine would stay with my wife and myself in our in our home which was always a great honor and the conversation would flow and we would we could complete each other's sentences yeah he was a great thinker great loss he was brilliant uh oh such a loss you know he was only 72 years old zev he he should have been with us another 20 years at least uh, we say in, in, in Jewish, we say in Hebrew, to 120. So yeah, that's yeah. the standard. Moses lived to 120. Yeah, but, I have the pleasure now of serving on the uh, uh, board uh, to select the annual uh, Rabbi Sachs Book Prize. Uh, so each year, for, last year was the first one. We're now coming up on our second one, where we honor uh, yeah. with the Rabbi Sachs Prize a book in Jewish studies. I think David Frisch was also, I think, part of one of those dinners you put together. That, that's right. Yes, David. Uh, David, I think, was the person who put together the memorial dinner that we did in honor of of Rabbi Sachs, and um, uh, some of his key staff members were there, and his friends were there. It was uh, it was a wonderful occasion. I'm very grateful to to David for the work he put together and uh, he did in putting that together. It was in New College, Oxford, which is one of the Oxford colleges. And although it's called New College, it was new in 1379. <laughs> <laughs> And I thank that he put together our show, put us together. So we were very appreciative, David, for that. So as we close out, and I know your ideas, and, and really this is just an exchange of ideas, but what's your biggest challenge? Because as I said earlier, it's important to have fidelity to family, to religion, to state, to country, to city, to be involved civically, not to be so self-absorbed. These are wonderful ideals. But what's intriguing to me is they did a study after the 1918 pandemic. And what they discovered was, Professor, was that after the pandemic in 1918, people became more hedonistic, less involved with God, family, they became more in just the pleasures of life. I would suspect that we were leading up to that before the pandemic. We were self-absorbed, mm -hmm. all these things. And the pandemic made things worse if we followed the trend of 1918. So that doesn't augur well to change in people's thinking or perspectives, at least in the short term. I think you're right to worry about that. If you ask me what the biggest challenge is, the biggest challenge is getting people to um, behave in a courageous ma manner. C courage is, is a, a virtue that's never in ample supply. <laughs> no, in no place and no time is there a, a surplus of courage. How do you teach but courage? It seems to be in very short supply today, and it's what we, we really need. Now, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is this, courage is contagious. When somebody stands up and models it, exemplifies it, people perceive the nobility of it and they wanna emulate it and people will copy that. Now here's the bad news. Cowardice is also contagious. When people see other people behaving in a cowardly manner, you know, cowering in the corner, refusing to stand up for what's right, refusing to stand up for what they believe in, they will emulate that behavior. So what I want to do myself, what I want my students to do, what I want my colleagues to do is to stand up and exemplify some courage. Say, break the rules, say things you're not supposed to say because of the woke dogmas and the uh, orthodoxies and so forth. Stand up for what you believe is right and then be willing to take the slings and arrows that come with it. Take a chance, be brave. That's what, one of the things I love about Mayor Soloveitchik. Not only is he brilliant, he's so brave. He will tell the truth no matter what. He doesn't care what people say about him. He doesn't care if people are gonna call him names. He's gonna speak the truth. You've been not afraid to, you've been attacked by, right? By anti-abortion, yeah. uh, by abortion. Uh, individuals and others so you've been not afraid to speak out and you want people to emulate you and you have a book in the offing too correct 
Uh, yeah, my most recent book is called Conscience and Its Enemies, Confronting the Dogmas of Liberal Secularism. That's the subtitle, Confronting the Dogmas of Liberal Secularism. But the book is entitled Conscience and Its Enemies. And is there another book in the offing, too? Uh, no, but uh, since we talked about Rabbi Sachs, I would love it if people would uh, go to Mosaic Magazine, uh, the Jewish magazine Mosaic Magazine, and read the tribute uh, to Jonathan that I, that I provided in that journal. You can find it online. My final question is, who, in your opinion, in the Jewish world has taken on the role of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs after his demise? It's an easy, easy question. Mayor Soloveitchik. And, <laughs> and, and Jonathan, Jonathan, him, Jonathan himself had the highest respect for Sully, as, as I call him, he's my student, and you know, I, I can refer to him by his nickname. Yes, Jonathan himself saw Sully as the future. Wonderful. And are you doing any joint events with him together? Uh, we just we've just done two. Actually, we did one at the Museum of the Bible, um, and then we did another one just last week at the Hudson Institute in Washington D.C. on the influence of the Torah on the American founders. It was a wonderful event, and that's available online. If you if you look up Hudson Institute and put in my name or the name of Mayor Soloveitchik, you can actually watch the video of our of our discussion. If you give out the information one more time where people can actually watch the video of you and Rabbi Soloveitchik. Hudson, uh, Hudson Institute, and, and the, the program was entitled The Influence of the Torah on the American Founding. And I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, really, it's been a pleasure. Uh, uh, you're not afraid to speak out. Professor Robert Peter George, a legal scholar, political philosopher, public intellectual, he's a fellow with Princeton University, and he's helped shape conservatism in America to today. And uh, do you think that, uh, and we are, he's trying to shape American society, Fidelity is every June, correct? Is that uh, what you're trying every to do? Every June, this is the first Fidelity month and we wanna keep it going for the indefinite future. We, uh, we, we should always be rededicating ourselves to Fidelity to God, to our spouses and families, to our nation and to our communities. Professor, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Zeph.